very much, Sarah, and, and thank you, colleagues, for uh, joining us once again in this uh, learning experience. Uh, many faces that are with us uh, often uh, throughout the weeks. Uh, I have seen you yesterday, but also many new faces that are uh, triggered by, uh, by this uh, very important topic for us. Uh, local economic development, as Sarah was saying, has, has been on our agenda for a very long time, but it's getting a very a special meaning in this, um, in this COVID era. And we think that it will be a concept that will need rethinking also for the, for the aftermath of the pandemic. Uh, when we have been dealing with local economic development, we have been talking about um, uh, proximity, eh? about, about a small business, about the potential of um, seeking the potential of each of the uh, territories um, as a system of cities and not in competition with, with other cities. And we have also been talking a lot about the necessity to ensure that the economic model would not be dependent from, uh, from, from very monothematic issues. Eh? I mean, diversified uh, economic models have always been very important in our discussions. Um, I have to say that this community is, is growing. Eh? Uh, many, many of our member cities and, and, and territories are, are applying these thoughts. But I think what this pandemic has done is to really put again this magnifying glass that we always talk about um, in the need to rethink the production and consumption system. And local economic development models will need to answer to that. We are going to have, and the, and the background note of this session uh, emphasizes this a lot, very, very challenging issue with unemployment, because one of the things that this pandemic has also made very evident is first, that our economic model um, is very dependent on the informal sector. So our formal economy is very dependent on our informal sector that we have very fragile uh, uh, work conditions uh, for many parts of, of our citizenship. And that uh, some, um, some are starting to think of, to quantify um, the poverty increase in our cities after this pandemic, very related to this very fragile status of, uh, of job provision. Um, in the hundreds of millions of people. Huh? So all, all of these things are the things that, um, that our membership is, is, is busy thinking about. We are right now at the state in the pandemic where we are just trying to help the most vulnerable, trying to organize a scaled up uh, come back to, to normality. But the biggest challenge, I think, will be uh, rethinking many of the models. The good news is, however, that many cities around the world, and I would dare say many of them intermediary cities around the world, that did not have the competitive nature, uh, nature that the big economic system was asking, had already started to look for other alternatives. And I have, um, I have the pleasure to see that some of those cities are, are with us and that they can share their, their examples. So I, I, will, I will stop here uh, because we want to hear uh, partners, uh, the practitioners and, and the cities um, sharing their, uh, their realities and, and their, their life experiences uh, with us. But please bear in mind that for the bigger, broader agenda, I think the concept of, of proximity and local economic development will be a very important building block of, of, uh, of the aftermath of COVID. We all know our territories will never be the same. And, and it is an exciting opportunity to, 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 to be in a place where we can actually shape that future. So um, many bad news, but also uh, some light in the horizon, and I hope we can see uh, both in this session. Thank you very much.
I would say, uh, Executive Director, the floor is yours for some uh, reflections and introductory remarks. Thank you very much, uh, Emilia. Uh, as we said, that the, uh, this is the 10th session that we have uh, together. So uh, again, city leaders, colleagues and friends, uh, as, as Amelia has mentioned, uh, COVID-19 is the most significant global health crisis of the last 100 years. So containment measures are having a major impact on the global economy and already causing massive job losses. So in the formal and informal economies of our world, in rich and poor countries, in North and South. So the worst is yet to come. Job losses pose serious challenges for families to pay for essential services such as food, rent, and utilities. So economic contraction means less work, but also less tax revenue. So local governments need to finance essential services and social programs while seeing revenue dry up. So many developing countries and cities are already facing severe challenges of food security and household poverty. Children lost out on play, education, and even vaccinations. And young adults cannot finish degree courses and have no hope to find employment soon. And many jobs in the urban sectors of hospitality, mobility, culture, and jobs such as attending shops or in support of people working in offices are already marginal before and have now disappeared and possibly forever. So yesterday, this initiative of online life learning had a session focused on COVID-19 in informal settlement and in the informal economy. So we are reminded that many essential jobs to keep crisis going in the developing world are done by people living in informal settlement or working in the informal economy. So we know that even in wealthy countries, people with lower incomes often do not stay at home, travel with public transport, and ensure that essential services keep running. So many of them are women and people in essential service jobs and in informal economy take a great share of the risk to keep up all safe. So to them, I would like to dedicate this session moving forward beyond the outbreak. Local economic development should be the commitment of all city leaders and all of us. We owe them the promise that we will create the space and opportunities for new job and more to come. And, and again, I remember that dear friends, when you come for the, for the our uh, uh, creating the space that when the, the opportunities of urban uh, prosperity is the driving motto in UN Habitat strategic plan for the next four years. We are not really uh, going uh, uh, in a way that is uh, very sad, but we are taking this opportunity of COVID, trying ways to implement our strategic plan. Our commitment of our work were approved 11, 11 months ago. And I thought that after the World Urban Forum in Abu Dhabi, we will zoom up you know, by all member states in the United Nations. But we are not uh, 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 give up, but our first commitment is to reduce the spatial inequality. So this is now more than important if we want to improve living conditions and for all, leaving no Please, one sir. behind and no place behind. So local economic development cannot restart without reducing spatial inequality. So washing hand for this, we need more action than ever on increased access to basic services. Public space, we need a new drive for safe public spaces to compensate for overcrowding, to organize small and safe markets, and to encourage urban agriculture in green areas. Affordable housing, this crisis, put this human right again in the spotlight, front and center. Our second commitment, friend, is the shared prosperity within cities and region. Collaboration is a crucial message for local economic development. The new urban agenda, had already this key commitment to support local economic development, fostering integration, 
cooperation, coordination, and dialogue across level of government and functional areas and relevant stakeholders. The COVID-19 crisis will oblige all local and national leaders to go back to the planning table to create the opportunities for local economic development in integrated city region plan. Our third commitment, our friends, that is to strengthen climate action. We don't forget climate action while this COVID-19 Right, making cities again healthy, reducing air pollution, protection, the environment, and making sure that people and communities and economy have guarantees of safety from disease and from climate shock. These were the drivers of long-term development more than ever. Our last commitment is most relevant today. UN Habitat was asked by the member state to lead on effective urban crisis prevention and response. That was nine months before the COVID-19. But these actions are crucial for social economic recovery to support social integration, cohesion, and re resilience, leaving no one, especially not women, elderly persons, refugees, and migrants. So UN Habitat will focus its work on supporting the capacity and knowledge of cities to be more resilient and strengthening their economies to better respond to shock and crisis in the future. I appreciate that we are joined today in this session by many friends from the ILO, which has put up a strong message to the world about the plight of the informal sector workers in this crisis, the need for social protection and the need for international and national government support now and in the future. I look forward to join city leaders, national leaders, and my friends in the UN system to plan and manage the recovery in the years ahead. We must be together to find ways to make sustainable urban development again as a driver of development and peace for all of us. Emilia, I'm sure we can do this together. Thank you very much, over to you. Thank you very much, Maimuna. Thank you for reminding that whatever way out of, of, of this very difficult time is, is going to be uh, a part and parcel of, of a green recovery. Sustainable development still needs to be very much uh, the key to, to all of this, uh, no matter what. I'm very happy to say that we are now already 212 participants, that, that we have a lot of participation of municipalities around the world. In, in particular, I would like to welcome uh, the colleagues of, of, of Cordoba in, in Argentina. We would have been there with you uh, one of these days. There will be another occasion, I'm certain. A particular welcome also to uh, our Ecuadorian colleagues, uh, colleagues from, from Andalusia and I'm from Colombia, but also many, many more around, around the world. And uh, thank you, Maimuna, also for referring to, uh, to, the UN, to the UN partners. I think they are very critical in, in helping us also local governments uh, spreading out our, our message towards the, the, the national governments. I think the local economic uh, forum um, ha has played a very important role in, in, in this respect and I would like to pay a special tribute to our colleagues from, uh, from UNDP uh, uh, and in particular UNDP Art that are joining us here today. So now I would like to give the floor to Sang Gong Lee, the ILO Director of Employment and, and Policy Department. Sir, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation and introduction. So can you put the my slides uh, on the screen? Oh, thank you so much. Um, uh, on behalf of the IO Director General Guy Ryder, actually it's my great pleasure to share our thoughts with you. Um, first of all, I really hope you and your families and colleagues remain safe and well. Uh, let me first uh, brief you on the, our latest assessment of the, how COVID-19 has been affecting employment. Next slide, please. Oh, oh this is something. Do you see the next slide or not? 
No, and your video is 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 frozen. Uh, now it's better. Now it's better. It's, it's working. So let us try the slide. Okay, can you then move to the second slide, please? Yeah, I, I got the message. My connection is not very stable at the moment. Sorry about that. Well, we, Sarah, can you manage that from your side? Uh, we try to work it out. Just one second. Yeah. I'm with my colleague. Well, I, I can. Can you give the uh, the right to share screen to me, or is it? We'll just we'll, we'll just uh, put yes. your we'll, we'll share the screen from our side. But could you please go ahead with your presentation? Okay, so the, let me continue. Sorry about this uh, technical glitch. Uh, yesterday, uh, we launched a third edition of the Iron Monitor, which we have been using to track the impact of the COVID nineteen on the world work since very early March. And overall, the situation has become significantly worse. At first, the proportion of the workers living in countries affected by workplace closures or lockdown measures declined to 68% from 81%. This is good news, but this is mainly due to changes in China. Elsewhere, the, work, the workplace closures have increased. The second, uh, I think it's better to show the screen, but uh, I'm not sure it's ready <laughs> because it has quite a bit of number of there. If it is, if it is ready, you will see it. Uh, but for the sake of time, there it is. There you have it. Okay. So could you continue, okay. you please, go sir? Go to the second slide, please. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so, okay. so sorry for that. We we have a problem here on the. Can you then the can you give the uh, the function to share uh, the screen so I can show it from my screen, if possible. Okay. Director, I am afraid you will need to uh, to be eloquent without the slides. No, no, we can. Phenomenal. Yes, but we don't have much time, yeah. so could we just no. proceed? Thank you. Okay, so I think the, this, this should be on the slide number two. Uh, the, another uh, important actually the finding we have is that the losses to working hours, they are quite large in the first quarter already compared to the, the last quarter of 2019, the first quarter saw the working hours decline by 4.5%, which means around the 130 million full-time jobs are lost. Uh, just to give you the idea about the, how the magnitude of job losses here, uh, you can remember that the, the, in the previous finance crisis, 2007 and A, the total job losses during this period was 25 million. So now we are talking about 130 million in the first quarter. In the case of second quarter, we raised our estimate to the 10.5% cut, which is equivalent to the 305 million full-time job lost. So and it's very important to realize what all of this means in human terms. This means the uh, loss of incomes and loss of the, for many millions of people, this is the less income, less food, and less health care, and less education. We also estimate about the enterprises as well, and worldwide around the 430 million enterprises are at high risk sectors, such as manufacturing and accommodation and food services, and wholesale and retail trade, and real estate and business activities. Yeah, that's, we got it. And then can we move on to the next one? Uh, the, and also the, our addition of the monitor also look at the impact on the informal economy. Uh, the global workforce at the moment is around 3.3 million and around 2 billion out of this 3.3, three billions are engaged in informal economy. As you, okay, as you can see the screen now, the next, not the next one, please. 
Okay, here we go. Thank you so much. And as you can see from the screen, this is around 60% of the workers are, are engaged in informal economy. Many of them are women and also migrant workers. Again, out of this 2, mil, uh, two billion, about the 1.6 billion informal workers are estimated in, uh, be, to be significantly impacted by the crisis, either due to lockdown measures or working in high risk sectors. Next slide, please. And what about the impact on, on the income and the poverty for these workers? The impacts are massive, to, to say in very simple terms. For example, when the crisis begins, the very first month, we expect the income of informal workers to decline by 60% globally. And in Africa, in America, for example, the drop is the largest at the even 80%. This would put the workers in life or death situation easily, unless there is a strong support from the government and the local government and for, from the communities. Also, we estimate the impact on the poverty as well. And then it, this actual crisis actually put up the uh, incidence or rate of the, po uh, the poverty is from 26 persons to uh, uh, 59 percent. In some reasons, this is as high as the 80%. Next slide, please. So given all this, the disaster impacts, what can we do? Uh, from the very early March, the, uh, uh, the ILO actually proposed a four pillars policy framework, as you can see from the screen. The pillar one is basically we need to create and maintain supporting economic conditions for a job creation or the maintaining job that include fiscal policies and monetary policies and finance support. And within this actually a supportive economic conditions measures, we have to do our things, absolutely anything possible to support enterprises and jobs and incomes, including social protection and employment retention measures and providing financial and tax incentive to enterprises, particularly small enterprises. And within this policy framework, it is absolutely important to protect the workers in the workplace from the risk of the COVID-19, uh, including OC measures, working time arrangement, and also it's very, very important to prevent discrimination exclusion. And it goes without saying how important it is to provide health access. In doing all of this, it's very important to rely on social dialogue to finding solution and implementing the agreed solution together. That actually making your policies more relevant and effective and also more supportive. Let me add three things here. The first one is we have to act very fast. Otherwise, we we'll lose the momentum and we are making the crisis even worse. The second, employment measures should be backed by the better and more comprehensive social protection. And third, Policy and actions should be coordinated globally. In particular, global action should be geared toward creating fiscal space for uh, the income and employment support in developing countries, especially low income countries, including debt relief. The last slide, please. So then what the local government can do? I would argue that the local governments can play really crucial role or, or the, all of these four pillars. This is exactly what actually many local governments around the world has been doing uh, at the moment. Um, for example, my home country in Korea, we start to see a lot of interaction between central government and local governments work together to provide lots of the support for enterprises and jobs and income. And I mean, it includes I me, mean, local governments can be very active to mobilizing financial support, especially SMEs and self-employed, and possibly with a clear linkages to employment support. If we are giving financial support to enterprises with the understanding that the enterprise will do their best to protect employment as well. And also the, when a crisis is gradually phased out, then we have to find a way of the bring workers back to work. That's important. In doing so, I think we have a very great opportunity to promote social and solidarity economy enterprises, especially when we are mobilizing huge public resources to actually uh, the provide income and employment support. Let me mention finally the importance of the 
investment in public work programs. Public work pro, uh, programs can help us building back better, that's an important term, by bridging the link between short-term income transfer and emergency measures to like, long-term strategies uh, on the public investment, especially in the social and physical infrastructures. For example, health, the environment, and crime and digital. Everybody can easily agree we have to do more, we have to invest more on that. Why not we are doing that right now? In doing so, again, this provides good opportunity to promote local economic development and, and social and solidarity economies. And uh, I cannot uh, conclude my presentation without emphasizing how important social dialogue is and social partnership is, especially including the social civil, uh, civil society organization. That's crucial in developing effective policy responses. I do believe this event is making excellent contribution in that respect. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Director. I am very happy that, that we were able to, to see your very interesting presentation and, uh, um, and, and uh, get a first hand on this very, very impressive uh, data that you, that you have presented. Um, I think you're absolutely right, Director, that we, that we need to make every effort that we can to protect employment, but it will be um, going hand in hand with the possibilities that, that our constituency of local and regional government gets in terms of support for income for the different sphere of government. And I also think that strengthening the public service provision can be very critical to underpin some of those, uh, those efforts. But um, the link between the informal and the formal sector, I think, is becoming uh, yeah, more and more relevant every day. So thank you very much for, for the data and for those reflections. And we will be very happy to continue working with you and, and, and calling for that social dialogue as well. And also a multi-level uh, governance uh, tables, which are not that obvious in every country, believe me. So thank you very much.